Here I have to introduce yet another theoretical concept and this is the uncanny. To understand what the uncanny is, uh, we have to take into consideration a general characteristic feature of language, namely that language itself is ambiguous. The meaning is always open to interpretation and the connotations of the symbol, because language is a symbolic language and this is the heart of the matter, why it is ambiguous, so basically these connotations, the interpretation of symbols, depend on the received traditions, what is embedded in our culture, in our education, and other aspects of tradition. To give you an example, uh, for one phenomenon or uh, one statement, and it can be a literary statement, a lot of valid interpretations can be attached, but as we know from Umberto Eco, uh, also, there should be possible to identify wrong interpretations. For example, Othello, the character of Othello as well as the, the tragedy of Shakespeare uh, as well, can be interpreted as a tragedy of anger, jealousy or revenge, but it's easy to dis dispute and actually refuse that it would be a tragedy of self-sacrifice. Now, great works, great cultural representations are always ambiguous uh, since the work is open, again, as Umberto Eco emphasized. Uh, a closed message is flattened by didactic and two, co two didactic commonplaces. So, in this uh, context, we have to realize that esoteric discourse is especially open since it is based on intuitive knowledge the audience can never fully follow the, the, the initiate who was the beneficiary of the revelation. If you remember the typology, what I've said a few minutes ago, there's three types of writers, the uh, insider, the outsider and the historicist. So even the skeptical outsider writers, if they manage to create something powerful using esoteric themes, we have to conclude that uh, those works remain open, undecided about the plausibility of the presentation of the transcendental experiences. The ambiguity can be created by employed irony as well, when what is stated is negated by what is suggested. This is a very tricky and funny definition of irony, and later on I will mention a few examples for that in various uh, novels dealing with esoteric themes. Uh, we also may come to the conclusion that writers in the 18th and 19th centuries, with some exceptions, tended to conclude their fantastic stories with some rational or scientific explanations. Some are rationalizing the transcendental experiences. The situation, however, radically changed with the rise of psychoanalysis. Freud's typology of the id, ego, superego, and Jung's theory of the collective subconsciousness re-established the validity of non-rational mental processes and of course that was a gateway towards postmodern uh, fiction in the 20th and the 21st century as well. Well, uh, continuing our examination of the uncanny, uh, we have to remember the origin of this term which was invented by Freud. Uh, Freud in German called it unheimlich. Now the unheimlich has a very rich kind of connotations and can be translated in, into English in a uh, great many ways. Uh, primarily it means, uh, well the English translation is uncanny. So the unheimlich is translated as uncanny, but the meaning of this word is really uh, covers a wide horizon. So it may mean strange, unfamiliar, unnerving, frightening, fearful. Uh, when Freud tried to explain this term, he offered an insightful interpretation of the short story Sandman by E.T.A. Hoffman. And if anyone is familiar with frightening children's stories, the Sandman who brings and takes away your dreams is a frightening and really kind of uh, uh, shattering experience. Uh, 
Uh, another very good example is Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis. You remember Gregor Shamsa or Samsa who locks himself up in his room while the family is outside and in a painful procedure he turns into a huge bug and actually we never learn exactly why this happened, how it happened, what is the meaning of that. Now this kind of uh, uncanny experiences or representations Freud explained that these are muted anxieties and subconscious fears of the main hero and of course with his special uh, focusing on uh, the sexual backgrounds of everything which is psychological he explained it that this is primarily a fear of castration. In modern literary theory the term uncanny is used primarily in connection with fantastic and esoteric themes. The feeling of unfamiliarity is generated by the realization that we cannot have a key to an unambiguous interpretation. A very good example for the novels of Uncanny from the period of modernism is Gustav Meyring's famous novel The Angel of the West Window. Uh, who was Meyring? He was born in Vienna in 1868 and lived till 1932. Uh, he was the son of a baron and an actress uh, and an illegitimate child. He was raised in Munich, then Hamburg, and finally, together with his mother, he moved to Prague. Uh, it turns out that his cousin was Christian Morgenstern, the famous uh, poet, uh, slightly absurd poet, and the two of them established a banking house in, in Prague. In uh, 1892, uh, Meyring had a kind of mystical, transcendental experience. Uh, he called it a kind of illumination. He was at home just about to commit suicide when somebody slid a little booklet under his door and when he opened the door and picked it up to see the title was The Other World. From this time on he engaged with studying esoteric uh, trends and, and wisdom and occultism. From 1893 he joined the English Golden Dawn. Uh, then he also joined the Theosophical Society and from the 90s he started writing his uh, deeply esoteric novels. Most famous is perhaps The Golem which was published in 1913 and uh, deals with uh, the Prague story of Rabbi Loeb from the 16th century and actually already in this novel he developed a kind of double uh, plain plot uh, one plane is in the present and uh, and another one in the past and there is a gradual kind of melting together of this past and present uh, time, sh uh, time uh, planes. Uh, another famous novel what I'm going to talk about a little bit is The Angel of the West Window which was published in 1927. Uh, what is in this novel? On this slide you can see uh, the main characters uh, on the one hand there is Baron Müller who is a, an early 20th century aristocratic character from Austria and it turns out that one of his uh, ancestors was John Dee, the famous Elizabethan magician from England early modern, from, of the early modern period. Uh, Baron Müller inherits the private papers of John Dee which contain his uh, conversations with angels, starts studying them and uh, the, the deeper he goes into uh, this uh, uh, lore and heritage of John Dee, the more he himself becomes entangled in an occult world. Uh, there is a storyline uh, taking place in the present and another storyline in the past and these two storylines are kind of melting and intertwining and the main characters in one world have a counterpart in the uh, second world. In the past Queen Elizabeth is very important in the novel whose uh, contemporary is Princess Asya, an emigre Russian uh, aristocratic woman uh, and so on and so forth and finally there is a complete uh, collapse of the two time planes all sorts of pretty strange visions and uh, illuminations and exaltation scenes uh, happen in the novel 
uh, the, the, the evil forces are uh, kind of uh, conquer everything around Baron Miller and he almost fails. In the meantime we learn that John D actually did fail in such a fight with the evil uh, and, uh, and Baron Miller has to fix now everything and finally he manages to fix and in a transcendental way becomes a kind of an avatar of humanity. So it seems that the ending of the novel is a kind of uh, uh, fir affirmation of the transcendental world, but the very part, the very last uh, little chapter of the novel is a fake documentary about some newspaper articles, which in a way question everything and put the whole transcendental story into a very ironic and uh, sarcastic light. So uh, we can say that Mayring himself was an insider, he dealt with esoteric things, but when he came to write in this novel, he, he felt that an uncanny uh, uh, kind of extreme ambiguity has to be maintained in this novel, and actually he quite perfectly managed to, to create this ambiguity. That's why it's still a very popular novel, it has various translations, and, and it's still a powerful reading if we read it today.